Uh, so thank you all for coming out to see uh, my presentation on the capstone. My name is Dylan Fleeby, and I uh, developed a high throughput method for the quantification of algae uh, using a technique called QPCR. And the specific problem that I was addressing was the need for a quick, accurate, reliable, cheap and easy quantification method uh, to go along with the optimization of the algae biofuel harvesting system. Uh, that's part of the algae biofuel project here at JMU. And the whole project got started with Dr. Bachman in 2006 uh, when he started to work with algae biofuel with uh, some other students on their capstone. And then in 2011, they developed the current method uh, for oil extraction uh, that was novel because it did it without actually removing the algae from the water. Um, and this created a need to know how many cells were essentially going into their system. So why algae biofuel versus other alternatives? Um, first thing is that it's, or fossil fuels are a limited resource and with algae biofuel it's renewable. We see that it grows quickly and we grow a lot of it. Um, and the second thing is that it's a carbon neutral fuel source. Uh, so it would have, or would um, sort of mitigate the effects of climate change that we've seen so far. So we can either basically continue down the path that we're going and possibly end up with a world that you see on the right, or we can switch and use more uh, environmentally friendly fuel and try and preserve what we have left, the world on the left. Uh, so as a solution. Algae biofuel is both renewable, like I said, it's carbon neutral, and it doesn't impact the food supply like other uh, renewable fuels like ethanol would. And if it was grown offshore, it also wouldn't affect any land. Uh, so we could still use land for growing crops or using it to build houses or whatever. And it's also a liquid fuel which fits the existing infrastructure, which also saves uh, a lot of money in the long run because you won't have to change anything. You can take algae biofuel and put it straight in the car that like Paul was probably drove here today. And the only downside to it is that it's currently very expensive and it's a major barrier to keep, that's keeping it from being fully implemented. So the current setup, what they have is they grow the algae in a large tub that you see in the top picture. And then when they're ready and they feel like it, the culture's reached a sufficient density, they send it to this blue pond at the bottom. And they mix the culture and water with hexane. And this pump shears the cells and releases the oil, which is then, uh, the hexane is the solvent, which then dissolves the oil into it. And they then separate it out in beakers like this. And they t basically take that top layer there's a top layer of like gunk and like cell mixture and hexane and oil and they take that centrifuge it down and then take what will then, what will then be like a clear layer that has just hexane and oil in it and put it through their uh, reclamation device which evaporates hexane which they then condense and use again later and the oil drops to the bottom of this device and they collect it there. So, the system is successful and it works. This vial on, in this picture is oil that they got out of algae. However, uh, the system is still too energy intensive, so they're putting more energy in than you could possibly get out with oil. And it also costs more to produce this oil um, than you could possibly sell it for at a reasonable price. So in recent years, the uh, whole project has shifted focus towards optimizing the situation or optimizing the um, whole system, and they hypothesized that concentrating the algae would make it possibly economically feasible by just with the theory that you could put more algae in if you concentrated it, but still use the same amount of energy. Um, to get oil out, but you'd also be getting more oil out because the culture was denser to begin with. 
and this created a need to quantify how much algae was going in so they could determine if, it, uh, if concentrating the uh, culture was actually making things better or not, which is eventually what led to my project. And so this is what kind of different examples of different concentrations that you need to quantify. The middle row, you can see it's really dark green, so that's like highly concentrated algae. Then the bottom row is kind of like medium, and the top row is like a pretty not very dense algae. So they're really looking at being able to quantify stuff from like two bottoms. And before I came, or before my project came about, there were two methods uh, to quantify an algae. The first one was to use a chemocytometer and light microscope. And what you do with the chemocytometer, it looks like this grid in the bottom. What you do is you count how many cells are in like the top left 16 squares, top right 16 squares, and bottom left, bottom right, and you average them together to get one cell count, and then you do that multiple times to get an average and a better idea of actually what your density is. Uh, so this is considered to be an accurate technique. It's pretty easy and it doesn't cost a lot of money, but it's very slow and strenuous on the operator. Um, and it's also not specific. So if you have any sort of contaminant in your culture that's visually indistinguishable from your actual algae that you want to see, uh, it will throw off your cell counts and make it seem hotter than it actually is. And there's also relatively large uncertainty in it. So there's, so when you like count uh, between the four squares, a lot of times there'll be significant differences in how many cells are in each quadrant of it, which leads to like high uncertainty. The second method is to use a spectrophotometer. And the spectrophotometer works by shining a light through the sample, and then on the other side there's a sensor which detects how much light is blocked by that sample. And that gives you an optical density reading, which is which correlates to a cell count. So like higher the density reading would mean that there's more cells in there, so you have a denser culture. And this technique is also really fast. It's also easy, and it's a high throughput method, so that means you can test a lot of samples at one time. Uh, however, it's susceptible to changes in chlorophyll expression by algae, so depending on the conditions that algae are in, they'll vary how much chlorophyll they're expressing. So if they're expressing less, you have a lower optical density measurement, even though there's still the same number of cells as you would if they're expressing more. That would give you higher um, optical density. It's also not specific either. So if there's contaminants, like I said earlier, that will increase your uh, measure or increase the optical density, giving you an artificially high um, measurement. And it's also has a relatively large uncertainty because. So this is where Dr. Wirsch comes in. He's uh, an expert in marine and microbial ecology and micro interactions. And he's also used qPCR to study gene expression in algae. So he was really the perfect expert to come in and provide guidance and expertise in developing my uh, technique. So PCR and how it works, it stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's just a way of creating a lot of copies of DNA relatively quickly, um, and it works in three steps. Uh, the first step is called denaturation, which is where you just take the double-stranded DNA that we have on the on the left, and you heat it up, and it denatures it and splits it into two single-stranded pieces of DNA. And the second step is annealing, which is uh, where you cool the mixture down and the primers, which are the small green, small little green rectangles, they anneal to a complementary section of DNA that's on the template strand. And then in the third phase, you, it's called extension. You heat the mixture up a little bit and then what's called DNA polymerase attaches to the small double-stranded section of 
DNA that you created between the primary and the template, and then takes the free nucleotides, which are like A's, T's, C's, and G's, part of DNA, and creates a second copy of the original string. And then you do that again and again and again. Usually it's 30 cycles as a typical PCR reaction. And from that, one from one single copy, you end up creating a billion copies of DNA at the end of it. So you can see how there's you can start with one and then end up with a billion, maybe like an hour and a half later. And in your reaction, there's typically not just one template template strain of DNA, there's you know, hundreds or thousands of copies, which leads to hundreds of billions or even trillions of copies of DNA after it's all said and done. So qPCR works on the same reaction as uh, regular PCR, except that it has, um, in this case, a dye that only binds to double-stranded DNA. So all the way on the right, uh, you have DNA that's denatured and the proteins are, or, primers and dye are still floating around separate from the template strand. And you have the annealing phase where the primers anneal to the complementary section of DNA and you see the cyber green dye starts to bind where there's double strand, short double stranded sections. And they give off fluorescence then, which is then measured by the qPCR machine. And then the extension phase, uh, after DNA polymerase has made the new dog strand, more of the dye starts binding forever. There's double-stranded DNA, and it gives off more fluorescence. So that's what you see in the bottom graph. Basically, the, on the x-axis, there's number of cycles, and then the y-axis, there's uh, relative fluorescence. And as you go through more cycles, you see that the fluorescence starts picking up and goes higher and higher. And what this shows is that um, the more copies you start with, the sooner you reach a threshold, which is that green line, which is just an arbitrary uh, level of fluorescence, fluorescence that you see. And then this is about the primer specificity. So my technique is specific, it can be specific down all the way down to one species. In my case, it was the genus Nanopropsis. And what this is showing is how the primers anneal to a specific section of uh, template DNA. So you see that A's and T's are complementary to each other in C's and G's. So this sequence that's in the primer specific, is specific to that section in the template DNA. So that's what makes this uh, specific. And it won't, so if you have another contaminant, it'll have a different arrangement of A's, T's, C's, and G's in their DNA, so it won't bind to that and it won't amplify that DNA. So just a little bit about what QPCR is. It's a uh, modern biotechnology technique that produces a lot of copies of DNA and then uses fluorescence uh, to quantify the number of uh, copies that have been created. And it's better because it's specific to what you're looking for, and it's not affected by chlorophyll expression. And once the method is developed, it's pretty easy to get uh, the measurement, and it's also not strenuous on uh, whoever's operating it. So to re reiterate the problem, uh, there was a need for a quick and easy cheap method for quantifying the input algae into this algae biofuel harvesting system. So my project was essentially to develop the method, the qPCR method, and then compare it to the hemocytometer and the spectrophotometer. And then I basically judged each of the three methods based on how long it took, the cost, how easy it was to do, the range of measurement that it could take, so like how dense or not dense the culture was the uncertainty associated with the measurement and its accuracy. So for my methods, I had to culture, a pure culture in the lab, I then took cell counts with hemocytometer, then did the, took measurements with a special spectrophotometer, then I had to develop the qPCR method, method from scratch, and then finally I compared all three techniques. So for culturing, 
Ultimate recipe started with 45 milliliters of instant ocean, which is just like a salt. Um, and then 200 microliters of nutrient A, which was trace minerals, and 200 microliters of nutrient B, which is nitrogen and phosphorus. And I mixed those with 1,500 microliters of water and split those into three beakers that you see over there, and then inoculated five microliters of the anaphylaxis culture into them and then incubated them at a consistent 22 degrees Celsius on a 14 hour light and 10 hour dark cycle. So during the culturing process, I had to continually check up on the density of the cultures and to do that, I used a fluorometer, which works by shining specific wavelengths of light at a sample and then that sample gives off fluorescence. So that's what's on the y-axis and then x-axis is time. Um, I had to wait until the cultures got to a sufficient density where it'd be worth doing the next step, which is DNA extraction, uh, to get like uh, more and a good concentration of DNA out of them and a good purity level. So DNA extraction, I use the Mobile DNA extraction kit specifically designed for uh, get extracting DNA from plant material. And the first step in the process was to prep the sample for uh, vortexing, which you add um, just uh, the solution PD1, which just prepares it. The second thing was to lyse the cells or vortex them. So that's where you break apart the cells to try and release uh, the DNA from inside the cell. And to do that, you add those two solutions which digests unwanted RNA, and then vortex them for 10 minutes, and then you centrifuge it after vortexing to pellet the cells, which is that dark green part all the way at the bottom. And then you take basically the greenish clear liquid out of that, um, out of that tube, add it to another tube, and then add two more solutions that uh, facilitate maximal binding of DNA to the filter which is, it's in a second, and then another solution that allows salt and other unwanted sort of chemicals that are in this solution to pass through the filter. So what you do is you take some amount of this solution, add it to the middle uh, tube, and that tube has like a little column in it with a filter at the bottom. And the idea is that you centrifuge it and pass that solution through the filter which the DNA binds to and then everything else is supposedly passing through to the bottom and you do that until you uh, run out of solution here and then the last phase is to pollute the DNA off of that filter so what you do is add the solution PD7 which is releasing the DNA from the filter and then centrifuge it and collected at the bottom, and that's where your extracted DNA is found. And once you do that, you need to check what the concentration of DNA and purity is in that uh, sample. So to do that, I used a special type of uh, special photometer that's specifically designed to detect uh, nucleic acids like DNA and RNA and proteins. And to do that, you just blank the sample, you blank the machine with water, and then you load two microliters of your uh, extracted DNA solution into the machine and just push a button and that gives you concentration in nanograms per microliter and it also gives you uh, a purity level from one to 100%. So now that I've extracted the DNA, uh, I have to select the primers that are specific to uh, the DNA and the process. And to do this, I looked to the literature and a uh, paper called Molecular Diagnostics for Modern <coughs> Continuous and Health Cultivation had already done a PCR, qPCR on this uh, same, same genus of algae. So that's the sequence for both of the primers, both forward and reverse uh, from the paper. And I also used universal eukaryotic primers as a backup in case those didn't work. And universal eukaryotic primers will bind to any eukaryotic DNA. So that 
decreases the specificity of my tests, which I didn't want, so I really hope that these did work. And after selecting primers, I had to do a regular PCR, um, PCR first. I had to do three optimizations, and you do a regular PCR first, because qPCR reagents are real expensive, so if it doesn't work, you kind of lose a lot of money. So you do regular PCR first and optimize it. So in the first one, I tested which template DNA and primer combination work the best. Uh, the second one, I tested the kneeling temperatures, and the third one, uh, primer concentrations. So the first one, where I tested template DNA and primary combinations in the lanes two through six contain the uh, eukaryotic primers and that created a product that was around 2,000 base pairs and uh, you can see that actually lane three doesn't have anything right here. That's because that DNA extraction wasn't good at all so I know that I can just push that one off to the side and not use that DNA extraction and then the lanes seven through 7 through 11 is supposed to be. Uh, same thing where the one DNA extraction didn't work, so I know not to use that one. And all the other DNA extractions work fine with these, both of the primary uh, combinations. The second optimization that I ran was annealing temperature. And it's really hard to see. Okay. So basically, the first, I basically created a temperature gradient. Uh, for the annealing temperatures of the primaries, and it went from coldest to warmest, from lane two being coldest, seven being the warmest. And first, or lanes two, three, and four, I got amplification. Anything warmer than what was in lane four, which was 55 degrees Celsius, I didn't get any amplification, which is because it was probably too warm for the primaries to actually anneal to the template strand. Um, and being colder than 55 degrees Celsius didn't really make it any better, so I just left it at 55 degrees. And the last one was to find the best primer concentration. With this, I wanted to see if I could get away with using less primers and still get good amplification, or if using more primers than I had been uh, gave me significantly better amplification. So in lane four was what I had been using, and lanes two and three were less, and lanes uh, five, six, and seven were higher concentrations of primers. So I basically concluded that going less gave me worse results, and going higher didn't really give me any better. So it just once again stayed the same. Now for qPCR, I kind of had to do the same thing where I tested the limits, the DNA concentration limits first, and then tested uh, primer concentrations again. And then the last one, I tested samples that were taken from the alternative fuel lab and their algae culture. Uh, so I do, I did, I have graphs for all of them, but I'm only gonna go over two, just for sake of time. And you saw this graph earlier. So basically what it shows is that the more DNA I started with, the sooner it reaches this arbitrary uh, threshold and this first set of lines on the left uh, was a 1 to 10 dilution of DNA and the second set was 1 to 100 then after that I did 1 to 1,000, 1 to 10,000, 1 to 100,000 dilution of DNA and those are pretty much indistinguishable from the negative controls which had no DNA in them at all and this uh, this next graph is called a melt curve what a melt curve does is it starts temperatures at 65 degrees Celsius and it takes fluorescence reading every half degree Celsius increase and waits to see when the fluorescence drops off. So there's two, you see there's two distinct peaks. Uh, the one on the left is created by primers annealing to themselves and that, if you remember, the dye still binds to any double strand DNA. So, we, so the primers are really short and they take less energy to uh, split apart. So that's why they separated first, and that's where this first <coughs> peak comes from. The second peak is from the 1 to 10 and 1 to 100. 
uh, DNA deletions, and they ended up splitting at around like 84 degrees Celsius. And so this is really what I did want to see because it shows me that I'm getting specific amplification because there's only these two peaks, and I know that the first one is primers, and the second one is uh, my amplified DNA product. And the last thing I did was to check the primer efficiency. And to do this, you graph the log of your deletion. So like the log of 0.1 is uh, minus 1, log of 0.01 is minus 2, and so on. And you graph straight, you graph a linear line, and take the slope of that line, plug it into this formula at the bottom, and that gives you approximately what percentage your primers are amplifying at. And mine were at 94%, which is in the accepted range between 90 and 105%. So the conclusions about which is best and which uh, for the um, how's your biofuel product, I use cell counts as kind of a baseline, so that's why it's all zeros. And a plus would denote that it's better in that aspect. Um, compared to cell counts, and a negative would be worse. So cell counts were all zero. For optical density and time, optical density is way faster. Uh, QPCR. Depending on how you look at it, it could be about the same as cell counting or worse. But since I had to develop the entire method, which took this entire semester, I considered it taking much longer, so I said it was worse. Cost, optical density, pretty much the same as uh, cell counting. QPCR was much more expensive. Uh, ease of use, uh, special photometer, and optical density uh, was by far the easiest thing to do. QPCR takes special kill skills and training, so I gave that a negative. The uncertainty, uh, optical density was about the same as cell counting. QPCR had a really small uncertainty, uh, so that was better. The range, uh, QPCR also was better. You can go lower concentration and higher concentration than both cell counting and optical density. And the accuracy, density was the same as cell counting, and I wasn't able to determine the accuracy for QPCR because the neck because I wasn't able to get to the next step in the process, which was to create a standard curve with known numbers of DNA copies in it that I would then compare my experimental trials to. And that's how I would have gotten an exact cell count, which I didn't get to this semester. So anyways, you total all of them and cell counting came up with zero, alpha density came up with two, QPCR came up with the minus one. So from this, I'm concluding that optical density is the best for the needs of the algae biofuel program. However, uh, Dr. Wirch is, uh, sees this technique as being really useful in monitoring and detecting um, harmful algal species in environmental samples. And this is because it's really good at uh, detecting low concentration of algae and in mixed species samples because you can make it specific to whatever uh, species you want to look at. So now to kind of get away from the technical side of my project, uh, I'm going to talk about how I ended up at this project or coming to this project. A little bit about the big picture. Uh, implications of actually implementing uh, implementing this or the algae biofuel in the real world. So, for me, this all started with my love for cars and uh, the internal combustion engine is driving. And as I got a little older, I recognized that doing that using internal combustion engines and fossil fuels together was harmful to the environment. Um, and it didn't necessarily give me a guilty conscience, but it made me wonder if there's a better way to use, still use an internal combustion engine because I like them so much, um, while still being a little better to the environment, which is where finding the algae biofuel project here at JMU came in because now I knew of a solution that was better for the environment and still fit in uh, internal combustion engines, which means it also fits in um, all the other infrastructure that's currently being used today. And then once 
Dr. Birch came on to the project and introduced the idea of using QPCR to quantify algae. I really married together all of my interests between uh, cars, the environment, and biotechnology and biology. And so my opinion of uh, algae biofuel all together, I think kind of made clear that I like algae biofuel as a solution and I would love to see it be implemented on a larger scale. However, it's still uh, very difficult to make economically feasible and so far really difficult to get significant volumes of oil out of all of these systems. Uh, which leads to Dr. Bachman's idea and how he would like to see it implemented in large scale. So what he was thinking is to grow large amounts of algae in dead zones in the ocean, um, specifically one that's off sort of southeast of the coast of Florida, that's in between Tropic of Cancer and the equator. And he thinks this would be a good idea because you won't need to build any infrastructure out there, cutting costs. Um, and you have relatively consistent ocean uh, conditions, so you'd be able to grow year-round, which would increase your overall production of algae. And there's also a large area, which would hopefully lead to uh, the extraction of large enough volumes of oil to actually be a practical fuel source in the future. However, the main concern that I have with growing them in the ocean uh, is the potential to create unwanted algal blooms elsewhere in the world. And in this part of the ocean, we have the Gulf Stream that kind of runs in a counterclockwise direction up the coast of the East Coast. So if you grew the algae out the dead zone, somewhere between, uh, you know, the western <coughs> coast of Africa and like Florida, it would take the algae and continually push it up the East Coast. And we already have problems with algal blooms going on just from background algae in the ocean. So doing this would just basically supply continually algae being pushed up the East Coast, which would lead to more algal blooms. And um, the kind of ironic thing about my project is that I developed it initially to uh, quantify the algae going into the system, but it would be really good to use it to monitor how much of this nanoprocess was actually being pushed up the East Coast of the United States and our coastal waters instead. And it would be much better applied in that situation than quantifying the algae going into the system. And there's still a few things that are unknown with uh, growing it in this sort of situation. And one thing that I have questions about is what are maritime law and international policies that deal with growing a fuel source in the middle of the ocean. Um, and there's also no proven large-scale operations that have worked, and that's mainly because all of the small-scale ones have proven that it's not economically viable. So nothing has been scaled up. And the last is uh, cost. It's still rel relatively unknown how much it costs to actually do this and grow, grow algae at a large scale in the middle of the ocean and then be able to extract the oil and get it to land where we can use it. So for me, I think that answering this question, are algae biofuels worth it, depends on the time scale that you look at. In the short term, I say no, because there's still so many challenges that are in the way uh, that need to be solved before you can actually implement it. However, in the long term, as we continue to use fossil fuels, I think that we will need something to supplement the dwindling supply that will eventually run out. So development in the long term and supplementing our use of fossil fuels with algae biofuel I think would be a worthwhile solution. But that is something that would take um, a really long time to develop and implement. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bachman and Dr. Wirtz for being uh, great advisors and mentors to me throughout this whole process. And um, if there's any questions, you have to take them out. How big are the mature algae cells? It's really small. I don't know exactly the size, 
but you need to like it. Take a look at the grid. How big is the grid? So the grid, penistometer, each one of like these squares is like I think a tenth of a millimeter. And there could be when I was counting them like this, this was hundreds in there. So they're pretty small. Like five, ten micron, somewhere around there. So, I uh, really like the, the work that you did. Uh, I think you did a fabulous job developing a new assay. And it's something that had never been done here at JMU before. I know you have an interest in biotechnology going forward, and you've been working with DNA, and simply using it to quantify things. But looking to the future, what do you think biotechnology can do to facilitate algae biofuels? Is, are there other applications of biotechnology that could enhance the production of an algae-based biofuel? Uh, I think the being able to use cellulosic ethanol would be better than necessarily using oil that's produced by these. Because you can grow a huge amount of these, and if you were able to break down the cellulose that's part of the algae, instead of using, you know, corn to do it, you could grow the algae instead and use land for other things like actually growing food instead of fuel and stuff like that. So for biotech so I think that's where I think that's where biotech could play a bigger role in figuring out how to break down cellulose and using that to create ethanol instead of using a biodiesel or algae biofuel. Well, if you use the algae, you could extract the oil and still use the... You could. So it could, you could do both, I suppose. But that still leaves the problem of optimizing the actual algae extraction, as oil extraction process, which True. is still yet to be proven. True. Any questions? Here's well, what was the biggest problem you faced? Uh, really, just managing time and getting everything done, which I didn't get. I didn't get to, f technically, I didn't get to finish. Because I wanted to create a standard curve that I could compare my like, fluorescence graphs to, I guess one on the bottom. So I could create like, a standard curve with a known number of DNA copies in it to begin with, and I would compare you know, how many cycles it took to get to there for my experimental samples compared to the standard, which I already knew how many are in there. And then I would have been able to actually come up with a cell count on that, instead of saying that it took this one less time than this one. And I know that this one's already denser anyway, because I diluted it that way. So that would have been the, the thing is to manage time better, I guess. And when did you get your final results? Uh, I took, so I took the samples, I did QPCR on the samples from the Alternative Fuel Lab on Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, if there are no other questions, let's give it up. <laughs>